Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It all happened in an instant. My brother and I, back when we were both teenagers, were riding our bikes down a rocky path somewhere in the back country of Jasper National Park, which is off in the Alberta part of the Rocky Mountains, in case you're, in case you're not familiar with the geography of Western Canada. We were riding our bikes down this rocky trail in the back country somewhere of Jasper National Park when we came to a steep downhill section of the trail. And at first, as we made our way down this hill with myself going first and my brother riding behind me, at first, everything was going fine. But then, all of a sudden, I heard behind me the sound of tires skidding on loose gravel and I turned my head and looked back in order to see what was going on behind me. And that's when it happened. In an instant, in just the shortest of moments, as my attention was taken away from what was happening right there in front of me, the trail as it laid itself out there in front of me, as I looked back to check to make sure that my younger brother was okay, the front tire of my bike hit a large rock in the middle of the trail, turned 90 degrees to the right, and I went head first over the handlebars of my bike and crashed down onto the trail in front of me. It all happened in an instant. Thankfully, I was not seriously hurt by that fall. Mom and Dad were always insistent about us wearing our helmets when we went out biking, and we were, for the most part, obedient children, at least with that kind of thing. And so we had helmets on, and I had my helmet on, and so my head didn't go crashing down onto the trail unprotected. The helmet took the majority of the blow, although this whole incident maybe explains a lot of other things about me. You're all putting the pieces together. Now, that's why he is the way that he is, but it's a whole other thing. For the most part, I was unscathed. You know, my shoulder was scraped up a little bit and all kind of scuffed up all around. But as a teenage boy, I was actually kind of proud of this wipeout that I had just had flying over the handlebars of my bike. That being said, I did learn a couple of important lessons that day. Lessons which correspond rather closely, I think, to the lessons that Jesus is teaching us in our gospel reading today. First of all, I learned that day as I went flying over the handlebars of my bike that distractions can be dangerous. It was a distraction, something happening behind me that drew my attention away from what was in front of me that sent me flying over the handlebars of my bike. Distractions can be dangerous. That was the first thing I learned that day. The second thing I learned that day is that even good things, even good things like looking back to check to make sure my little brother was okay can be a distraction. Even good things can be a dangerous distraction. Those are the two lessons I learned that day. And like I said, those lessons that I learned that day, that distractions can be dangerous and that even good things can be distractions, those lessons correspond rather closely to what Jesus is teaching us in our Gospel reading today. At the very end of our Gospel reading today, Jesus says, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And with these words, Jesus is talking about distractions, things that would pull our attention away. He wants us to imagine some guy plowing a field, not a modern day farmer who has a giant John Deere tractor with GPS that stops him from ever going offline, but a guy standing behind a, a, a yoke of oxen, you know, with his plow in the ground who has to keep his attention forward, otherwise he's going to go veering to the right or to the left. Jesus says here, 
just like a farmer plowing his field in that old-fashioned kind of way, must keep his eyes fixed forward on what he is doing, so must you, my disciples, keep your eyes fixed on me. The distractions, he's telling us, that would turn your eyes away from me are dangerous. Dangerous enough, he says, to make you unfit for the kingdom of God. And that's pretty serious. So Jesus is talking about distractions. He's warning us about distractions. But Jesus is also teaching us here in the remainder of this reading that even good things can be distractions. We have this thing here at the end, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. But when we go back now through the rest of the reading as we just heard it, we see that there's four examples here, one after another, after another, after another, of people being distracted. And what we'll see, as we're going to work through them one by one now, is that each of them is distracted by something that, at least to a certain degree, we could call a good thing. In other words, they're not distracted by just purely evil things. They're distracted by good things. So let's go through these examples one by one. The first example we get in our reading today comes from two of Jesus' own disciples, James and John. James and John, as you heard in our reading today, they were rather upset about a, Sar a Samaritan village which had refused to welcome Jesus. Jesus had sent his messengers on to this village to let them know that he and his disciples were coming to ask that they could be received in the village, and the village had said, no thanks and let Jesus to go on his way. And this upset James and John to such a degree that they decided that they should ask God to rain down fire from heaven and burn up those no good unbelieving Samaritans. They thought that they needed, James and John did, they thought that they needed to defend Jesus, to stand up for Jesus' honor. And so they came up with this idea to rain down fire from heaven. Now. The raining down fire from heaven part is obviously a little much, right? We've gone a little far here. It's a bit extreme. But if you just wind it back a little bit and think about the, the impulse, the reason why James and John have this idea, you see it is actually kind of a good thing at its core. They want to stand up for Jesus. They want to defend Jesus. If people around us we're speaking ill of Jesus. If people around us were misusing or abusing Jesus' name, standing up for him, defending his honor, defending his reputation would seem, at least to a certain extent, like a good thing for us to do. We shouldn't call down fire from heaven. But standing up for Jesus seems to us, I would suggest, like kind of sort of a good thing. Jesus, however, doesn't see it that way. Jesus calls it a distraction. He rebukes James and John for their idea of raining down fire from heaven, but also because they're so preoccupied with defending his honor and his reputation that they've lost sight of what Jesus has really come to do, to offer his life on the cross for sinners, including those Samaritan sinners who just rejected him. James and John are distracted by their desire to defend Jesus' honor and reputation, to the extent that they miss out on what Jesus is really here to do. A good thing, then, can be a distraction. The next example of a distraction that we get here in our reading today comes in the form of a man who volunteers to become a disciple of Jesus. This man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, Initially, this guy doesn't seem to be distracted at all. Quite the opposite, actually, right? He's ready to follow Jesus anywhere. But Jesus looks into this man's heart and sees there something that you and I can't see. He sees a distraction. He says to this man, foxes have their holes, and birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man... This guy you are saying you're going to follow anywhere he goes. He has no place to lay his head. This man may not seem on the outside to be distracted, but Jesus looks into his heart and he sees a distraction. And the distraction that he sees there 
is the comforts of home. The joys of having a nice, comfortable life. Notice again, however, that the thing that Jesus is describing as a distraction is something that we would all consider a good thing, right? The comforts of our homes, whatever they happen to be, are good things. We love and enjoy the comforts of our homes. We give thanks to God for the comforts of our homes because he's the one who's given them to us. But Jesus warns us that even our homes, the comforts of our homes, can become a distraction that keeps us from following him. The people of Israel, way back in the Old Testament, they're a good example of this. After God rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, he led them out into the wilderness and began to take them to the promised land. Now, life in the wilderness was far from comfortable. And shortly thereafter, the people of Israel started to long to go back to Egypt. Why? Because they longed for the comforts of home. They forgot about that whole slavery business and how miserable life was back there. But at least we had homes, we had beds, we had food, and all that kind of stuff. And they want to go back. They forget about everything that God had done to save them. They forget about how God had set them free from slavery. They forget about God, how God had parted the Red Sea and let them walk through on dry ground. They forget about this promised land that God is promising to take them to. And instead, they just want to go back to the comforts of home. Just like the Israelites in their journey to the promised land, our lives as disciples of Jesus in this world are not meant to just be comfortable lives. Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him, and that's not comfortable. So the comforts of home, the desire to have a nice, easy life, that can become a distraction too. The next example we get here in this reading today, the third example, is a man who says that he's willing to follow Jesus. Jesus says, come, follow me. And the man says, yeah, I'll do that. But first, he says, I got to go and bury my father. Now, we've got to read between the lines here a little bit and understand what's actually going on. More than likely, the man's father is not actually dead yet. Otherwise, that guy wouldn't be there talking to Jesus. He'd be in the middle of burying his father right now. Back then, 2,000 years ago, it wasn't like it is today, where when your relative dies, they go off to the funeral home and can wait there a week or two until you decide you're going to have a funeral. Back then, you died and you were buried on the same day. It's how you did it. So that man's father isn't dead yet. And so what he's saying is, Jesus, I will come follow you, but first I have to take care of my father until such a time as he dies. And then after he dies, I have to bury him, do the proper procedure for all of that. And then he says, I will come and follow you. Now, notice again that what this man wants to do seems like a good thing. He's not saying, Jesus, I'll come follow you, but first I need to go fill my belly at the local tavern or something like that. He wants to take care of his father. He wants to keep the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. He says, Jesus, I'll follow you, but first I have to honor my father by caring for him through the remainder of his earthly life and making sure that he's buried properly. He wants to do a good thing, but Jesus calls it a distraction. Leave the dead to bury their own dead, he says. Some of the most shocking words Jesus ever said. But as for you, he says, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This man's desire to keep the fourth commandment is obviously a good thing. Jesus is the one who's commanded him to do this. Jesus is the one who gave the people of Israel those ten commandments. But in this case, the problem is, is that his desire, this man's desire to keep the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, is actually preventing him from keeping the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. By refusing to follow Jesus in that moment, the man has put his father before Jesus, before his God. Even our commitments to our family, then, Jesus is telling us here, 
are otherwise good and God-pleasing commitments to our family, they can become a distraction, Jesus says, if they come between us and Jesus. And that brings us to our last example. One more man who says he's willing to go and follow Jesus, but first wants to do something else. In this case, he doesn't want to go bury his father. His father maybe is going to live longer or something like that. He just wants to go home and say goodbye. And once again, what he wants to do seems like a good thing for him to be doing. Not only that, but it doesn't really seem like something that should be a big deal, right? How long is it going to take him to go and say goodbye to his family? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour at the most? Couldn't Jesus just wait a little longer or something like that? Not only that, but in our Old Testament reading today, the prophet Elisha, he got to go home and say goodbye to his family before following Elijah. So there's a whole precedent here. But Jesus still calls this a distraction. This is when he brings out the thing about the plow. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This too, Jesus says, is a distraction. In each of these examples, these four examples in our reading today, the thing that Jesus calls an, an, a distraction is something that we, at least to a certain extent, would normally consider a good thing. Jesus' message then is clear. Even good things, even things that seem good and right and reasonable to us can become distractions. Distractions that take our attention off of Jesus, distractions that turn our eyes from him, distractions that are dangerous because they have the potential to leave us as those people who are unfit for the kingdom of God. Jesus, as our Lord and Master, doesn't just come to demand a little snippet of our attention on Sunday morning. He comes to demand all of our attention, all we are and all we have. So what are your distractions? We don't want to just leave it here and say, oh, those people back then, look at how distracted they were. Uh, don't be like them. You know, move on. The reality is, is that he, just like each and every one of them, even disciples of Jesus, just like they were distracted, each and every one of us is distracted too. So what is it for you? Like it was for them, it could be something that is otherwise good, innocent, normal. For example, your family could be a distraction. Jesus wants you to love your family. Let's be clear about that. Jesus wants you to care for your family. But if your love and care for your family is drawing your attention away from Jesus, then it's become a distraction. For example, if your love and your care for your family prevents you from coming to church and listening to Jesus, it's a distraction. But it could be more than that too. It could be your nice, comfortable way of life. As North Americans, most of us are blessed with nice, comfortable ways of life. And living and enjoying them can become a distraction. The idea of taking up a cross and following Jesus doesn't sound very appealing to modern 21st century North Americans. We want the comfortable life. Maybe that's your distraction. It could be all kinds of things. It could be your career. It could be your friend of circles or circle of friends. It could be your reputation. It could be anything that you've cultivated for yourself in your life. Whatever it is, whatever the distraction is, Jesus is calling you today to put it in its proper place. He's not a telling you, and I want to be clear about this again, to abandon your family. Jesus will never tell you to do that. He's not telling you to give up your home or your ordinary way of life or anything else like that. But he is telling you to put the things in your life in their proper order. In other words, he's calling you to put all those other things, whatever they happen to be, in line after him. Being a disciple and following Jesus comes first. Everything else comes second. Anything else, everything else that tries to take his place as front and center in our lives is a distraction. As we reflect on our lives, 
think we can all recognize that we're all rather distracted. But that's when we need to come back to the beginning of our gospel reading today and the words that Luke started with. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Our hearts are distracted, left, right, and center, all over the place. But Jesus' heart is not distracted. He sets his face like flint, like stone, unturning, resolutely and determinedly focused on Jerusalem, and he marches there one step after another, knowing full well what waits for him there, and not turning even for a second to the left or to the right. Why? Because of his love for you. His undistracted, perfect, and complete love for you that loves your distracted heart so much that he would give his life so that you, distracted as you are, would be fit for his kingdom. So as we sang a few moments ago, let us ever walk with Jesus. Follow his example pure, his undistracted example. But even more than that, let us ever fix our eyes on Jesus, the undistracted one, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and even now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, because in him you are fit, you are worthy for the kingdom of God because he gave his life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.